As Easter people who observe the cyclical nature of the church's year, arriving at Passover, arriving at Good Friday each year, has me more and more appreciating the words that come to us by way of our tradition, in the sense that these words of comfort that I'll share with you come from a 17th century country parson named Samuel Crossman. Dermid McCullough wrote of Crossman in his history of the church, saying that as a rather reluctant Anglican priest of a Puritan outlook, Crossman spent most of his ministry in a small Gloucestershire parish whose chief hamlet is delightfully known as Easter Compton. Though briefly, at the end of his life, he was dean of Bristol Cathedral. Not much there, except that Crossman wrote a handful of devotional poems, one of which McCullough writes is of an unusual meter, but nevertheless genius. Beginning with the words, my song is love unknown. It ends rather poignantly the tale of Jesus's arrest, trial, death, and burial with an exclamation of quiet joy. Confessing, as it were, that this suffering so long before had shaped the life of Mr. Crossman in his little English parsonage all the days of his life. And, as is the case, that suffering so long before has also shaped our lives as well. And thus, with Crossman, we can affirm, I think, that here we might stay and sing, that there was no story so divine, never was love, dear King, never was grief like thine. This is our friend, in whose sweet praise we all our days could gladly spend. Crossman's poem speaks to many things, but one I am certain of this day is the way that it gives to those who hear it a kind of perspective. For today holds with it both great sorrow, and we feel that, but also great hope. The Passion of John is surely the most front and center witness of the day. And it is, some might say, the confession of the church on this day. It is there for us as a visceral testament to what our Lord bore for us, and indeed for the world. And in the face of that, I think it's only natural that we grieve. You know, there is something I've learned about grief recently, that when it is so intense, so present, so real, Sometimes there is no way that we can see around it. And certainly, we cannot see through it. Grief, it has been said, has the power that can stop us in our tracks. And in so doing, even has the power to have us question the firmness of the ground that is beneath us. In other words, sometimes grief is so intense we are held captive by the immensity of it. The disciples must have encountered this. They would have had to. And they did so even though Jesus throughout the Gospels 
had tried to prepare them for this hour. And thus we have what they didn't in that moment. And so I think it's only natural that we grieve for them too. But perspective, even if it is given, nevertheless still has an edge to it. It is still sharp. So much so that as we draw near to it, draw near to its perspective on Good Friday, we do so drawing breaths that are shallow. A bishop of the church once wrote, here is more or less the full set of John's imagery of the passion. The grain of wheat, the grain of wheat must fall into the earth and die. Today is the commemoration of that hour for which Jesus has been waiting. His death, therefore, is not some sad accident cutting short a promising career, but the climax and purpose of his whole work. In this act, God will glorify his name, and in being lifted up, glorified, crucified, Jesus will and has drawn all people to himself. How could it not be so? If indeed his cross, Jesus' cross, our Savior's cross, is the true revelation of the true God, and if what we see in that revelation is the face of love. This is perspective at the foot of the cross, even though the cross looms large for us today. Again and again in John's gospel, Jesus constantly offers to those who listen to him, to those who follow him, signs that point to the great moment that is the cross, that is this day. Jesus is lifting up, indeed, his glorification upon the cross, stresses that the crucifixion is, for better or for worse, the revelation of the glory of God, the God of saving and healing love. And the better is, the better of that part of the equation in a way that I don't think, in a way that we cannot comprehend. The cross is God's way of creating something new. For upon his return in the age to come, Christ says, behold, I make all things new. And in Paul, we find affirmation when he writes that the cross seems to be foolishness to those who are wise. In other words, that God might die does not make sense to anyone. But suffice it to say that if we go all the way back to the beginning of John's gospel, might we let these words wash over us? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Thinking about that 
and about what we just heard in the gospel for today, I don't think that we can miss the great irony that is today. Especially when you consider Jesus, who on trial before Pilate is flogged, dressed in a purple robe, crowned with thorns, is brought out before all the people, and Pilate exclaims, Behold the man. We as Christians thousands of years later say, yes, behold him. But the wise will say, this is absolute folly. To those with perspective, perspective of a thousand or more years, we see here the true man, the true human being, the one who with crown of thorns and all truly reflects the image of a loving creator who would die for his creation. In John's words, the word was made flesh and is indeed crowned king before us this day. And we now behold his glory, glory as that of a human bleeding figure who is the one who has been given by the Father to save us, to save the world. In Crossman's words, that is a love that is unknown. That is love to the loveless shown. This is grace, you see. And it is why we will end this service by recalling that grace, knowing, and this is pretty important, knowing that just as the creation of the world was finished on the sixth day, so it is with the work of the Incarnation, the Son of God, who finishes his work on this, the sixth day breathing his last, saying, it is finished. And we who gather here give witness to that work, and that we have gathered to behold his glory, glory as a loving God, glory as a loving Son, who has finished the work given to him, the work of redemption. 